minutes. All right. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second of the three parts of this uh, doctoral defense. Uh, Trun Andresen has uh, handed in uh, Dr. Silus thesis entitled on the dynamics of bone circulation, creation and death, a control system approach uh, for evaluation uh, as a PhD, uh, PhD Dr. Silus uh, degree at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Uh, to uh, evaluate this uh, thesis, the university has appointed the following committee. Uh, Professor Steve Keane from Kingston University in London and Associate Professor Michael Rodziki from Worcester Polytechnic University in the US and myself from Granval and uh, NTNU as an administrator of this uh, committee. Uh, an hour ago we heard uh, the first of the two trial lectures, uh, the one on the uh, health chosen, on the chosen topic. And uh, now we will have the second trial lecture on the topic that was given to Trun uh, two weeks ago. Okay, so the title you have it there, uh, can we uh, use control system type of uh, thinking and insights to processes in society, politics, media. So uh, this is the structure, a very brief background history. Uh, the big uh, chapter is uh, in red uh, right in here. Uh, and then something that's fairly uh, unusual for control engineers, uh, and at last, why at all should we help <coughs> with this? Okay, so history, uh, you, uh, many of you know this uh, famous uh, Norbert Wiener from 1948, who coined the, the term uh, cybernetics, from the Greek word for steersman, and his book Control and Communication Game Man and the Machine. And this inspired a lot of people, also people in the social sciences. And you, you, you got something in the 50s called socio cybernetics, uh, which I'm no, no historian of, but I've tried to check it out, but it didn't really take off. Uh, a lot of uh, verbal analysis and a lot of talk about. Uh, how cybernetics is important, etc. But uh, it doesn't seem to have taken off as far as I can see. There is an interesting episode in Chile in 1973. Uh, the British academic Stafford Beer uh, tried to control the whole Chilean uh, productive system uh, in real time uh, by a centralized computer uh, installation. Uh, but that was cut off uh, literally by the military coup. But that's part of the history of applying cybernetics to society. Uh, the last thing is, um, as, uh, is system dynamic. Uh, system dynamics, which is the name of trying to use uh, cybernetics in uh, organizations, management systems with humans in them. Uh, and uh, this has uh, become very uh, well established, formal modeling, simulation, own symbols, toolbox, which we will look into, uh, resembles, uh, I mean the symbol toolbox, uh, diagrams, etc. resembles control engineering uh, uh, tools, uh, but, but it's different. So they talk about the same thing, but with differ different um, symbolics. Come back, I will come back to this, because this is the most important thing about, I think, about applying control system thinking to, uh, to uh, society or uh, systems with humans in them. So, so let's now go into uh, important characteristics of social system dynamics. And these are my views, what I think is important. I mean, other people may think other things are important. Uh, one characteristic is for systems with humans in it, it is that you have runaway dynamics with saturation. Uh, control engineers are not very interested in what you say exponential uh, explosive dynamics because they want to eradicate them. So we are usually only interested in things that jump up and then sort of stabilize and uh, do as we want. But uh, in uh, so, uh, systems in society, you have renovated dynamics, but the point is that if you have that sort of dynamics, 
then it can't grow forever. So it, you will reach a roof, you will have saturation. That's one interesting aspect. Uh, another uh, aspect is, which I'll come back to, is that you will become often stuck in a suboptimal uh, end result, and it's very difficult to get out of it. Uh, furthermore, related to that point, the, the last point, you will have changes uh, in society organizations which are nearly irreversible. So I will uh, talk a bit about that. And uh, also about the role of media in all this and uh, the uh, phenomenon of the self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, society processes are fussy, diffuse, uh, very complicated and different to model. I will say something about that. And they are um, special in the sense that the components in the system, as opposed to the technical uh, applications, are conscious. And they know that they are part of a system. And what does that lead to? Okay, first the generic system, units, which mostly will be humans in our context, uh, they uh, influence each other. And we can define a group of such units as a system, and it's dynamical because it changes with time. And uh, one of the interesting uh, phenomena in uh, 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 one more thing is that there are variables that influence the system, which, but which we define as not being part of the system. And um, this we call uh, exogenous in system dynamics, and in, in uh, control engineering we usually call them a disturbance. And uh, I would say that the criteria, whether this should be outside or inside the system, is that if it influences the system, but the system does not influence the disturbance, then it should be outside the system, but have a narrow into the system. Okay, so then you have the uh, feedback or interaction, which uh, we see here, we have a loop with this component, influencing this, influencing this, and back here. Circular causation is another word that's used. So let's look into, um, uh, Runaway dynamics with saturation. This is the famous uh, March 2000 NASDAQ crash in the US on the IT uh, exchange. Uh, some of you might remember this. Uh, also in Norway, where we were around here, you could read in, uh, for example, Norwegian business papers and also American, that the, the IT economy was a new type of economy. So, so it, uh, regular economic laws for the stock market do, did not apply to the IT economy. And people were investing in companies uh, and blowing up their share value, uh, companies that hadn't earned one dollar. So this was the situation, and, and you had what you could call super exponential growth in the index on that uh, stock exchange. And of course, uh, sooner or later, someone understood that I have to get out now. And when someone gets out, the other guys will get out very fast too. So this is what happened. Um, some people have said to me that, well, what's the problem with that? I mean, this is just a zero-sum game for speculators. I mean, one speculator's gain is another speculator's loss. But in fact, it has uh, uh, serious real economic implications. I remember in Norway, many years after this crash, uh, the computer science uh, uh, department at our university hardly got any good students because IT wasn't cool anymore. So you had, you had a depressed period where we didn't get the real talent, talented people into computer science before this was mostly forgotten. So it has big consequences, not only for the speculators. But this is a system with uh, exponential dynamics or runaway dynamics but obviously also with saturation, it crashes into a roof. So that's one example. <laughs> so herd mentality, that's a cybernetics uh, concept. Uh, you, you run after the other guy, and that goes both ways, on, uh, on the upside and on the downside. And this is also very interesting. Uh, they, 
everyone knows that a stock market is basically unstable in the long run, and that exponential growth cannot continue forever, but no one does anything with it. There is, there is no big discussion about, uh, among economists or in the financial newspapers what sort of simple control mechanism could we introduce to uh, avoid such episodes. I have not put that into my talk here today, but I have three proposals that anyone interested can hear about. They can they have to send me an email. Anyway, uh, this point is again what I uh, talked about in my former presentation. Uh, engineers would shake their head if there is a big instability that is recognized, you do something about it. We don't just let it go on. And we have the same situation in the stock markets worldwide today. We are re reaching dangerous heights again. Anyway, uh, now we look at another um, uh, runaway dynamic system with saturation, taken from a textbook which I used in a course I give. Uh, that's very funny, by the way, this book is about system dynamics, dynamics in organizations and so on, with humans in them, but it's called business dynamics because then you can get more paid seminars and courses, etc. Et <laughs> but it's a good book, so I use it. Okay, so let's look at an epidemic. So this is this is the famous susceptible infectious model, a very simple model of an epidemic. So you can imagine that we have a, 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 a town with n people, which is constant. No one dies from this epidemic. And um, at the start, there are a few people who are infectious, and they infect those who are non-infected, what we call susceptible. So the sum of susceptible people and infectious people is constant. It is n, because no one dies. And this diagram that we have here, it's called a stock flow diagram, and it's used much in system dynamics. Um, so I'll try to uh, explain a little, because you, you can make a simple uh, differential equation which says the same thing, and in fact more precisely. Uh, it says that the rate of increased, uh, increasing infection, uh, di, dt, is a product, I'm trying to point to the mouse here, of what we call the uh, contact rate, which is the average uh, times per person that that person needs another person during a day. Uh, the infection <coughs> probability, small i, which is if you meet a person and you are susceptible and the other guy is infected, what is the probability of infection? Uh, what is the probability of a, uh, here we have the number of susceptible people and inside the parenthesis is the probability of that a susceptible person meets an infected person. And if you multiply all these factors together, you get the differential equation for increase in the, uh, for, for the infection rate. And up here in the diagram we have a sort of vessel here. Uh, where the vessel with susceptible people is emptied through this valve and it fills up the valve with infectious people so that after a while everyone is infected but they do not die. So this is a cybernetic model of a simple type of epidemic. Uh, one important point is that uh, these arrows have, uh, here say that um, um, how, how things are influencing the valve, but it doesn't say anything about the mathematical relationships. So in that sense, this gives the exact uh, dynamics. This gives a sort of intuitive, uh, intuitive uh, description of the same thing. So uh, you also have loops here. This is a, a feedback loop, contagion, and this is a damping loop, depletion, and so, so that reinforcing balancing, so we use R and B in system dynamics. Okay, so if we, as a control engineer, I like, uh, well, uh, I'll just have to look a bit more. This is the actual, uh, if, we, if we solve this thing over here, we get uh, what we call the logistic curve, which looks like this. 
and the derivative of the curve is this one. So, so this is just managing or, or modeling a system which is fairly non-fussy. I mean, it's a system with humans, but it can be modeled fairly exactly, so it's a bit closer to a technical system. Um, and one important point that I will return to, that this model it, uh, re, um, ignores changes in unit behavior. Because if you are in a town where an epidemic is taking off, you will change your behavior because you know that you're part of the system. If you are uh, on a little island with the rabbits and you get an epidemic with the rabbits, they will not. They will behave just as they always have done, even if they are uh, infecting each other. So, so this is important. I'll come back to that. Okay. So um, uh, let's do the same epidemic model in a block diagram. It looks like this. So we have the uh, uh, exogenous parameters. You have the infection rate. And uh, uh, notice that you only have one integrator in the system because since the sum of susceptible and infected people is constant, equal capital N, uh, then in fact you have only one system, it's great. So this is the way I would have liked to do it, but, but I'm also starting to get used to the system dynamics symbolism. Okay, so let's get back to the cartoon that was put up earlier as a teaser. This is an epidemic dynamic system. Uh, we have basically three system states. We have the, the adult car, the hipsters. We have industry, which jumps onto a trend. And you have the, 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 the broad, uh, non-cool masses, who tries to copy the avant-garde of the hip up here. So we have three types of epidemics. First, you have an impulse starting the system, because you have this hero from a rock band, for some reason, who, uh, during a concert, he had a sock hanging out of his pocket. Uh, probably because they were got mixed in the washing or something like that, and, so, and he hadn't seen it. And the hipsters immediately pick up on that and put socks in their uh, uh, pants. And of course, industry jumps on, uh, and it goes completely over the top, top down here. And you have the teenagers who buy these pants, and the gay guy who have the sock in the other uh, pocket, etc. Et <laughs> And of course, uh, uh, hipsters recoil in horror because the broad masses are adopting the trend. So they start uh, going around with the sausage necklaces instead. <laughs> so that they can be cool and in front. And this, this is a dynamic system with epidemics, an epidemic with three system states. You might say that this is uh, not the most important thing in the world. But um, it's quite fascinating. Uh, I, I'll just uh, mention an example that I um, talked with Tony about. Have anyone noticed that um, during the last 10 years, uh, uh, people in power positions, I'm talking about men, have st stopped using ties? and going around with open shirts instead. I mean, they still have a jacket, but they have an open shirt. Might even be colored a little. But 10 years ago, all had white shirts and ties. This is also a, a, an epidemic with a very slow dynamic, a big time constant, because uh, someone starts, and the other guy uh, decides that I can try it too. So, I mean, I've seen several people starting to do this, so I can do it too. And it goes very slowly. Another interesting dynamic process is, um, have anyone, I expect all of you have been to a symphony concert, as opposed to a rock concert, or a jazz concert. And if you are at a sy uh, symphony concert, you will notice that people applaud extremely long. And you look at the guy beside you, <laughs> is, is, he still, is he still uploading? But sooner or later, someone will tire, because I mean, you can't upload for 10 minutes. And, and, and then you see that the other people are stopping to upload, so you, you take the risk and you stop uploading too. This is also a dynamic process with, a, with some interesting uh, 
uh, time constants and uh, real uh, interactions. Okay. Uh, so that then comes, the, I'm a David's advocate. I mean, I like thinking cybernetical about these processes. But why can't we just discuss it verbally? Do we have the sort of uh, need pretentious diagrams and differential equations? And this is a good argument. So, so, so whenever you try to, to, to sort of extend yourself and be very uh, rigid and uh, physical and uh, scientific about this, you, sh you should ask yourself, well, I, mean, I, I can explain all this by just with a few words. So be careful. Don't be pretentious. Okay, so let's uh, uh, look at path dependence. We have now looked at epidemics and uh, uh, exponential growth. Uh, this is a fairly famous paper that was published in uh, 1990 uh, by a guy called Brian Arthur. Uh, and his point was that if two companies started out with, with a new type of product and technology at a certain time, uh, it was not given which of the two technologies would win and in random events at the start or stupid decisions at the start uh, could decide that one company would grow at the cost of the other company. The famous example used by um, uh, Brian Arthur is, uh, we go back to the video times now, uh, there were two standards for uh, video cassettes. One was VHS and one was Betamax. Uh, Betamax was technically the better standard, it gave better quality, video quality, and was also adopted by a lot of broadcasting companies. But VHS won, so that all the uh, VHS players and the, the VHS cassettes that you could rent and buy, uh, or the cassettes you could rent and buy, was <coughs> by the VHS standard, and Betamax Max lost out, except for professional applications. And this is, uh, this is uh, an interesting point, and the basic uh, factor is what we call increase, increasing returns to scale, which means that if you somehow, at the outset, get a little in front of the other guy in the amount of stuff you sell, then you have uh, economics of scale, and you can draw even further away from this uh, com competitor. And, and this is symbolized by this, um, uh, by the, this um, little drawing here uh, with, with, a, with a sort of roof that if, if you somehow fall on either of these size, sides, uh, one of you will lose out completely and the other guy will win completely. And this mechanism of increased returns to scale and um, random st uh, starting events applies to all sorts of uh, uh, processes in society. Uh, <clears throat> an example in Norway uh, that you guys know about is, uh, is a website called Finn, where you can sell and buy uh, uh, used and new stuff. And uh, it was started by a Norwegian media corporation. And today, uh, and they have taken the whole market, and it's a money making machine. And it's completely impossible for anyone today to start a competing uh, uh, company uh, doing the same thing. You have the same with newspaper. Uh, in Trondheim, we have a big uh, uh, newspaper. Earlier, we had three newspapers. The biggest newspaper has gone completely out because economics or media has an increasing returns to scale. So that if you get the upper hand, uh, then you can be mediocre and still uh, have the whole market for yourself. So this is very important. Um, so let's now look at uh, something resembling uh, the earlier points, locking and irreversible changes. This is um, the situation earlier when uh, women had uh, no right to vote. And they won in the UK, you know the famous uh, struggle there during the First World War. And of course before that you had laws that uh, only gave men the right to vote and the men don't want anyone else to vote. So you had a sort of locked in situation. Uh, I use, usually I like the quote from the British Parliament around the First World War when they had the discussion. 
where some of the guys there said that giving women the right to vote was just as meaningful as giving it to horses. So we had an other way of thinking at that time. Okay, so uh, today uh, women have the right to vote and we have laws that give universal uh, right to vote so that we are locked in in another situation. So we are transited from one locked in situation to another situation. And the question of how to transit between locked in situations uh, hopefully from a bad locked-in situation to a good locked-in situation is a very interesting question and it's a question you can think cybernetically about. Okay, so um, when, you, when, when politicians or, or a nation or whatever make a change that is impossible to reverse, it's usually uh, called in a euphemistical way, a reform. Reform has a positive uh, connotation. Uh, so let's look at this uh, issue. For example, if you have heard this, let, let's try the other side for the next four years. And if it doesn't work out, you can go back to, to, to your regular party. Uh, and this ignores that some reforms are extremely <coughs> difficult to reverse. But the guys in the political parties, they are very aware of this. Uh, so that when, when you get into power, you do a lot of stuff that can't be reversed. Uh, the, the party strategists are also very aware of that they should not talk about this. Um, so that people see you can believe that you can just change things around again if you are dissatisfied. Um, so, so let's now consider lock-in uh, in related to irreversible changes in society. Uh, Sturman's book, uh, tec the textbook, is only about the problem two firms starting out at the same time with the different technologies for the same uh, application. What should we do not to lose out? That's very important. But I think the more important is apply the uh, issue of lock-in to social and political issues. Uh, so for example, transiting from one locked-in equilibrium to another, for example, Let's say the Americans, Mike, uh, you, you perhaps would want a health care system like in Canada or Norway, but you are fairly locked into the current system. Um, and we have something called a basin of attraction, which I'll show in a graph in a moment. Um, and they, they change because of the transition between locked in situations. Uh, we use a, a metaphor of a ball. Uh, in, in a smooth valley uh, to illustrate the point. Okay, so here we have uh, what we call a basin of attraction, and I define downwards direction as better. So if we could get the ball over here, over the top here, have to, uh, it may be a bit, a bit of a work, a bit difficult, and get it down there, we will have transited to a better situation. Like this. So let's give you an examples of what I would say have been good transitions. Uh, but before we do that, let's look at how the basin of attraction changes shape after the transition. And, and, and this um, uh, latest shape here is because when you have moved from a, a bad situation to a better situation, then it will be more difficult to reverse it and get back there. So the basin of attraction changes shape. Okay, examples. Ban on smoking in public places. I remember the big debate in Norway. In fact, it was a, uh, what do you say? Uh, uh, doing something against human rights and so on, if you ban smoking in cafes and restaurants. No, uh, no it's completely irreversible. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't get that law reversed. And for example, mandatory seat belts, which we got in Norway many decades back. And I am so old that I remember when you had serious philosophical discussions about whether this was according to human rights, to, to, to make it illegal not to use seat belts. Uh, and we have a discussion in Norway now. Yeah, well, this is also a fairly irreversible reform, uh, removing the death penalty. Uh, and this discussion we have in Norway now Basic dental care, should that be put into the, the uh, Norwegian health uh, system? 
it's not mostly. So people can get very bad things because they don't have the money to, to fix things. But if we get basic dental care into the Norwegian uh, public finance health system, I, I believe it, it, it will be incredibly bad to re, uh, difficult to reverse it. Okay. Uh, so um, these are bad with that question mark because now we are into politics and you may disagree with me. So let's see that you have a good situation and, and somehow you, you get into a worse situation. Uh, the, the shape of the basin of attraction will change also because, but it will not be as difficult to get back to the good situation if you want that later on. And examples of this are, you know, I think, these things here. In Norway, we have sold out the right to fish, trade legal fishing quotas, which is incredibly difficult to reverse. So there you are. That's at least my opinion. Okay. Uh, then I'll go into media. Um, uh, if, if the media repeats something, it becomes true, even if it's a falsehood, you are lucky. Uh, on the other hand, if you if you don't talk about something or mentioning it only negatively a few times, it will seem impossible or crackpot, even if it's a good proposal. You also are lucky. Therefore, uh, media should have as a sort of objective. I mean, they should be truthful, of course, but, but they should not repeat falsehoods, and they should uh, have uh, the attitude that they should make the good impossible possible. Okay, so I have this organism metaphor for how the media in a complex modern society functions. And I can see that since modern complex society is very interdependent between different sections that have to work together, then you can say that it is, it is a, not a one cell organism, but a body with all sorts of different organs that must work together. And that sort of organism, as opposed to a one cell organism, needs a brain, and media is part of society's brain. Uh, the first role of the media is to inform the organism as a whole what's going on, getting information in. Second role is processing information um, and deciding what to do together with organizations, research, academia. And the third role is, of course, sending out signals that ensure that the organism takes appropriate action. This should be the uh, role of media. And the point is, this means that media should be regulated. But I'm not talking about censorship. I am talking, talking about the framework and, uh, and, and the operating conditions for media in society. For example, if I just give you an example, I would have liked to have two newspapers in Trondheim and not only one monopoly newspaper. But the only way to get that is to tax the rich newspaper harder and uh, somewhat subsidize the small newspapers because of increasing returns to scale and the mechanism I have talked about earlier. So this is also uh, a control <coughs> system um, this, uh, approach to these problems. Okay, so um, one point, a further point, social processes are fuzzy. And uh, we have in uh, system dynamics, they use um, causal diagrams, which we'll see in a moment, can be used for numerical situation, give useful overview and insight into interactions. We can see damaging feedback loops uh, and possibly <coughs> unintended side effects of what we are going to decide to do. Uh, so this enables good decision making, but I say hopefully, because that's not necessary, I'll come back to that. Okay, so here is a, a causal diagram with non fussy non-quantitative variables. And this is the discussion of should we build more roads in our big city to, to get less waiting <coughs> time or congestion or car traffic. So it's like uh, desired travel time by people between A and B. Uh, if the desired travel time is large, I mean you accept to wait a lot, then there's a minus on this arrow here because the pressure uh, towards politicians to reduce, to do something about congestion is low. So this is, this, in this diagram, it's, a, it's a, uh, an exogenous factor. Uh, 
if the pressure here is big, you have a plus up here, you decide about the road construction that takes time, you get larger highway capacity, that reduces travel time, uh, which again reduces pressure uh, to uh, reduce congestion. So this is a balancing loop, so that everything is hunky dory. You can solve this problem by building more roads. Traffic volume is an exogenous uh, variable, um, and uh, for those who are used to Norwegian politics, <coughs> this is the way our uh, Progress Party, Party, discusses the issue of what to do with a lot too much car traffic. Just build more roads. Okay, so the point is that it isn't that simple, and empirical data shows that it isn't that simple. Copenhagen has recently expanded their road capacity strongly, and it has turned out that traffic has just increased more. Okay, so this is the way you should think about it. <laughs> Up there, uh, in the pink ellipse, is the progress party way of understanding the problem. <laughs> uh, suddenly, traffic volume is not more exogenous, but connected to all sorts of other factors. And they also include uh, the public transit system and what happens with the public transit system uh, because of private car traffic. There, there are a lot of uh, feedback loops here and uh, I have uh, uh, marked the positive feedback loops here. As I say up to the right, look for the reinforcing loops because that's those that are a problem. And uh, I'll just show one feedback loop in this uh, in this uh, diagram. Uh, there are more, a lot, to, you can trace them yourself, but you see, if highway capacity increases, the size of the region around the city uh, where people uh, want to commute, to bring a commute into the city increases, um, and you can't get around the bus, as it says here, um, the adequacy of public transit gets lower, uh, private car driving gets more attractive, private car traffic volume increases, travel time increases, pressure to increase, congestion increases, etc. So you have a positive feedback loop, and this is just one of them. So you can say that you are a politician, you are sitting here discussing what should we do with the traffic problem, and um, um, then someone should insist that this diagram is much better than this diagram. So uh, then comes the, <clears throat> the question uh, whether this is enough. Will we take a, make a good decision about traffic? Uh, <coughs> before we come to that, I'll just make a little point about uh, what it means that a human is part of the system and you are conscious and you know how the system works. I used an uh, epidemic example uh, some minutes ago. Uh, people will, if, if you have a, an epidemic, you will not meet people as often as if you don't have an epidemic. And uh, uh, when you meet a person, you will try not to sneeze at the person because you know how the system works. This is not the case with rabbits. And that means that a system with humans has different characteristics when the components in the system uh, know how the system works, and of course this also has negative uh, uh, repercussions because you can gain the system if you know how the, the system works, you will change your behavior to exploit the system in a negative way, and you get unintended side effects from the persons who constructed the system, uh, even if the new politics was good intended. But okay, evolutionary psychology. <coughs> Uh, when all decision makers in our community uh, decides about uh, traffic solutions based on the fancy big causal diagram that we looked at a moment ago, will we make a rational decision? No. People often make unwise decisions even if the correct information is available and understood by all. So we need something more in our uh, social dynamics control systems toolbox. So we go here. This is a book that uh, um, was written by some colleagues here in Trondheim, which is about uh, safe, 
uh, human society consist consisting of uh, small flocks of b b b baboons or chimpanzees with hierarchies and so on. So let's go into that uh, using evolution. Um, we, uh, evolutionary selection, I mean, we know about they have a stomach or a digestive system based on the Stone Age period, etc. You have heard that story. But the point of evolutionary psychologists is that our brain is also hardwired because of uh, what succeeded and what didn't succeed during evolution. So, I mean, you have seen this. We humans are so nice because uh, if you were nice and uh, uh, took good care of your kids, cooperated with the other guys in the little group and so on. You were successful and passed your uh, nice genes on to your next uh, generation. But that's not controversial because we like to talk about that. But then we have all these uh, traits that, that are, were also uh, contributed to getting surviving descendants that could have further descendants. If you were a dominant person, who were the alpha male or the alpha female, if you were good at all these sort of steps here, you usually also got kids that survived. You also passed, so you passed on also those genes. So we are we, we have we have evolutionary two types of baggage. Uh, we are dirt bags and we are nice and emphatic at the same time. So this is the point. And uh, it would be very much useful when we make decisions uh, based on uh, cybernetics insights about feedback and blah, blah, blah. Uh, we should also be aware of our mental tra traits. Uh, have you ever been to a meeting uh, which is going to make an important decision? And you know that the guy sitting over you by the table there understands what is the best, the wisest decision? Uh, at the same time, the guy, it turns out that the guy votes the other way. And why does he vote the other way? Well, he wants to be friend with the, the, this guy on the board of the corporation, or he, he don't want to, to vote for something that he knows will get few votes, because he wants to be on the winning side, checking which wind, why, uh, when the wind blows. So that means that this is the way we behave, because we have this hardwired tendency to run with the crowd and uh, be a friend with the alpha males and uh, or uh, have a nice position in the hierarchy. So uh, when you have a de decision process, you could say that because I understand this thing about evolutionary psychology and how we are hardwired. So I can say, I can say to Tommy here, we are in the same meeting, I'm going to make an important decision. Tommy, I know that you are going to vote with the chairman of the board here, but at the same time I know that uh, uh, I am right and uh, we have the same understanding, so you should really have voted the other way, but you just want to set up with the chairman of the board. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, imagine if you have a board meeting and you start talking like that. Well, I mean, in the old days you would have a duel, of course, but, but the point is that this is actually going on. People make unwise decisions even if they have the right information. So this is obviously not easy for us. So I think that we should include this sort of thinking in system dynamics. Okay, so why should control engineering engineers uh, interest themselves for all this? Uh, you, have you seen this? Uh, some of you have a course in social sciences or humanities. So we have this sort of important uh, distinction are you writing about this in a descriptive way, way? Or are you also including your own opinions? <coughs> then it's normative and it's bad, or slightly worse at least, not very scientific. So what about engineers? We are in fact very normative because we do things, we, of course we talk, but um, uh, mostly with the purpose of solving things. So we are extremely normative. So in my opinion, normativeness uh, is a good thing. Uh, and I will also say we have a deeper understanding of uh, dynamics and academics in the social sciences. Are there anyone here that are offended? <laughs> no, no protest? A little much <laughs> Okay. Uh, so we should, uh, could that should contribute, 
But I would say that we have so much fun with our physical technical systems. We see uh, how the things work, and uh, this uh, social <coughs> political stuff is sort of flaky and diffuse and so on, and doesn't lead anywhere. That's us, uh, and much better funding. Uh, and some of my colleagues would perhaps say it makes no difference whatsoever, but we might, might attempt to point out or propose, and that's somehow a bit, it, it's right to some degree. And uh, I end the presentation on that pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. I'm sure, we have time for one or two questions. If you have uh, any, I completely agree. The question is, how would you bring evolutionary psychologists into system dynamics? What are you doing technically? Well, at least I, I used one of the authors of that book as a guest lecturer in my system dynamics course. I'm talking about actually if you wanted to have a system which had, for example, you've got your feedback and that simple infection approach. Now, what you would have, of course, is that if there was infection going on, then there'd be a reaction of people to have less contact. So you're putting a feedback loop in the system where the parameters for contact would drop as the awareness of the infection arose. Mm -hmm. So it's that sort of, because one of the advantages of multi-agent modeling is you can actually build evolutionary dynamics under a multi-agent approach. Things like NetLogo, you can actually cause the parameters to evolve. Um, and what's one of the weaknesses I see, I'm, I'm definitely a top sound modeler. But I've got plenty of students who want to do bottom up because they think that's the only way you can actually get emergent properties. So they're wrong, but that's what they believe. So what I'd like to be able to show is how do you get a system dynamics approach that builds in the same evolutionary characteristics from the top down rather than the bottom up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that would be very interesting if you can account for, say, irrational uh, or human folly mm -hmm. in decision processes and build this into model models. Mm -hmm. And that would be interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Let's do it after you finish your PhD. Hmm? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's just taken 20 years. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you've hit upon one of the um, most important uh, issues when, at least in, when I put on my economist hat rather than my modeling hat per se, and that is how do you get um, social change to occur. Very tricky, as you have pointed out. Uh, going back to the limits to growth, uh, famous Forrester and then the Meadows is a books from the 1970s that were very popular with some folks and very controversial with others. Um, one of the, uh, the things that that led to was, all right, how do we, we, we are, we're alerting the world to a problem here. Uh, the most recent uh, example would be perhaps climate change. Uh, how do we get people to do something about it? And uh, the original idea was go to the churches. And uh, you know they, they seem to be able to get groups of people to change their behavior and what have you. So that was the original thought. Um, didn't work out very well, but that's where they started looking. Uh, but I'm leading up to my point. Uh, today, our best guess as to what might work uh, to get large groups of people to change their behavior is gaming. Turning these models into engaging games. Mm. So rather than putting bullet points up to groups of people and scolding them saying, you all should be doing this, 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 and this, I'll tell you what the insights are and just go ahead and do them. That doesn't work. Instead, you make a game that's very engaging. Well, everybody likes to play games, right? And you let people discover by playing with the model in a very user-friendly and engaging fashion, uh, some of these insights. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so I'm just wondering, it's, it's, not, it's just sort of what's your impression of gaming in this in this realm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's a good idea, uh, but but I haven't done anything about it. So I mean, I, I just use prudent points and say that this is the correct way of thinking about it. So um, in that sense, I'm. I do what you, you, you want to get away from because I, I agree that uh, as a pedagogical tool and you, letting people discover stuff by themselves, by sort of interaction with the game, it's a very good way to go. For example, if you look at the climate change thing, uh, today you, have, uh, you can in fact model the process of getting people to accept 
that something should be done with their own behavior because of climate change. But now I think it, we are stuck in a moralizing situation where the uh, people advocating for changed behavior or because of climate change are starting to resemble a religious and very, very self-satisfied sect, uh, sort of telling people that they are bad because they are not like me, who are really serious about climate change. So, so and uh, yeah, and, and this is not the way to convince the non-convinced. Yeah, so, so perhaps try again. Yeah. Well, that's, that's actually a good, uh, couple of points there. First of all, I really want to reiterate Tom's point that social scientists have completely stuffed up <laughs> analysing and changing society for the better. And the approach as engineers have is definitely superior, and I want you all to invade that go. Okay. Uh, but one little part about this as well is that the gaming point Mike's made is very valid too, because when you look at the control system, you're trying to design something which is self-fixing. Okay. The, the, the classic being the original James Watt, and, it may not, the monitors itself it works without any interaction. But in a social system, people are putting inputs in from all sorts of directions, changing a complex system with beliefs about how it will function, which are wrong. But they never see it until after they do it, and then they blame the rest of the world for it rather than themselves. So I've built a software package I've called Minsky as a, as a system dynamics for, uh, for engineers. At the moment, of course, I, you can change parameter values while the simulation is running and see the impact. But I want to generalise that so I can have multiple people working on that at once. And then you see, when they put their inputs in, the feedback of what they're doing completely changes the outcome. So initially I can show that what they want to do, like for example, the best way to reduce the government debt to GDP ratio from one of my simulations is for the government to run a bigger deficit. Okay, It's a feedback effect. They think the best way to run a smaller deficit. If they run my model, they run a smaller deficit and the government debt to GDP ratio increases. So what do they do? They go to a surplus, which gives you a bigger deficit ratio. The opposite of what they expect. But I want to have a whole lot of them working together and doing it. So again, in a systems engineering approach, what would be really useful is to design systems where there's more than one controller being able to put feed into a system and get the feedbacks and see what happens and learn from that. And that's, again, your technology is far in advance of anything that social scientists themselves have designed. Okay, then I think we'll uh, close this part of the event. Yep. And uh, we'll meet here again at uh, 115, or preferably a few minutes before, for the main part of the event, uh, to present his uh, thesis.